for the third day of the Poema workshop. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce Monique Laurent from CWI. And the best thing about being the chair today, this morning, is that Monique doesn't need any introduction. And she simply can start. Please. Thanks, Frank. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. So, it's a pleasure to be here and to be uh, uh, to have been asked to give this uh, tutorial. So, the tutorial is going to be about uh, uh, sums of squares. Uh, hierarchies for polymer optimization, and more specifically about convergence analysis, about the convergence analysis. So we, what we want to understand is, if you solve the uh, relaxation at a given order, you get a bound, and you want to know how far is the bound in the terms of the minimum, of the true minimum, uh, depending on the degree. And there are several hierarchies which have been introduced in the literature. There are lower bounds, there are upper bounds, so in this first part, I'm going to talk about uh, the upper bounds, and in the second part, uh, the second part of the tutorial will be given by uh, Lucas, Lucas Slot, and he will discuss how to analyze the lower bounds. So this is a topic which I've been working for some time now, for even some years, uh, in, in, in collaboration with uh, Etienne, with Etienne de Clerc and uh, more recently in collaboration with uh, Lucas. So most of the results are actually joined with, uh, uh, with them. Okay, so let's get, uh, so please, maybe I sh what I want to say is that if you have questions, don't hesitate uh, to interrupt me. I, I, I don't see the chat, so I, I will not see the chat, but if you have a question, don't, don't hesitate to just interrupt me and ask. So, just let's uh, again uh, uh, set the stage. So we have a polynomial f, which we wish to minimize over a compact, um, possibly semi-algebraic set k. So we want to compute the uh, f min, which is a minimum value taken by f over k. And uh, what I want to point out is that this is a, uh, so this is a general setting of polynomial optimization when k is uh, semi-algebraic. And this is a, a hard problem already in very uh, uh, special uh, cases for the set K. So when, when the set K is a, a box, a hypercube, or a simplex, or a sphere, or a ball, um, we, we get already a hard problem because it permits, for instance, to capture the problem of computing the maximum uh, size of an independent set. So we don't need to see the exact details, but uh, so this parameter alpha of G is uh, uh, the maximum cardinality of an independent set in a graph. And what we can see here is that there are several ways you can formulate it, either as a maximum of a quadratic polynomial over the box, or as a minimum of a quadratic polynomial again of a standard simplex, or if we replace the xi non-negative, if you write them as xi squares, then you get the minimum of a quartic polynomial over the unit sphere. So all this shows that uh, it's already interesting to understand the behavior of uh, sums of squares uh, hierarchies over such simple sets as a box, a simplex, a sphere, etc. So these two tutorials will deal, as I already said, about the convergence analysis for hierarchies of lower bounds and upper bounds for polynomial optimization. So we will have two hierarchies, which we are going to be discussed this morning. The first one is what I would call the usual sums of squares based lower bounds. So these are lower bounds, which is indicated by an index R, which is a, 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 a sub-index, which is defined as the largest lambda for which F minus lambda can be written as a conic combination of the constraints, which defines the set K where the multiplier sigma j are sums of squares, and you put a degree bound on it, and in this way you get the lower bound uh, f sub r. And uh, the, the behavior, the convergence analysis of this hierarchy of lower bounds will be discussed in the next tutorial by Lucas. In this tutorial now, what I want to do is to analyze a hierarchy of upper bounds, so f with the exponent uh, r uh, now as an exponent, which are sometimes called measure based. To, they will also be defined in terms of sums of squares, but the main principle at the back of them is um, trying to, they are measure based, so it's just to distinguish them. So it's interesting in itself 
But uh, as we will see, actually understanding the behavior of the upper bounds will also be useful for the analysis of the lower bounds. So these two uh, sites are interrelated, as, uh, as you will see in the second uh, tutorial. So I will uh, now just switch to the to the upper bounds, which I uh, uh, will introduce. So the first part, I want to introduce this measure-based upper bounds, which have been introduced by Lasser. So the starting point to define them is to, uh, uh, to, to, to realize that the minimum of F, it's a well-known factor, but to realize that the minimum of F can be reformulated as the following uh, program on probability measures. So what we want to do is find a probability measure nu on k, supported by k, uh, for which the integral of f the nu is small as possible. And the claim is that the minimum of f over k is equal to this to the minimum value of this program over measures. And this is actually a very simple thing that just to the proof, it's a two-line proof. So first inequality, let us check that the minimum over new is at least the minimum of f. Well, this follows simply by observing that f of x is at least the minimum of f. So you, you pull out f of x out, and then you get the integral of the new over k, which is equal to one, because we have assumed that the measure new should be a probability measure. So we have already one inequality. This reverse inequality is also uh, easy. So what we do is, we take a global minimizer of f over k, let's call it a, and then as a very special probability measure, we select the Dirac delta at the global minimizer. And then if we do this for this choice of nu, we, the integral just evaluates f at the global minimizer and you get f min. So in this way, we get the reverse inequality. So, this is a very simple uh, uh, observation, but it's quite fundamental. And the basic uh, idea here is that you are identifying points in the set with Dirac delta measures on the set K. And let's keep this interpretation uh, at the back of our mind because it will be useful. So what Lasser showed in uh, uh, 2011 is that actually in this uh, uh, reformulation above, we do not need to minimize over all probability measures, what it suffices to do the following. Let us pick one specific measure. Let us call it mu. It's uh, fixed, it's given, and it's a reference measure who is supported uh, by the set K. And then the claim is that we can now restrict the optimization to measures mu, which have a sum of square densities with respect to mu. So, we, we are going to optimize over all sums of squares h, and then the measure of d nu is just h d, d mu. So in other words, the minimum of f is equal to the infimum of this, of this program. So we, we take so the, the variable is h, the sum of squares. The objective function is the integral of fh. And so there is only one constraint, which is that the integral of h d mu should be equal to one. So this is saying that we have a probability measure. So intuitively, this is uh, maybe not so difficult to get uh, convinced that such a thing should be true, because if we remember what we observed above, uh, we observed that actually the, the uh, a, 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 a minimizer would be the Dirac delta at a global minimizer. Uh, so then the what one can observe is that you can approximate the Dirac delta by continuous positive function and thus by sums of squares polynomials. So this is a uh, rationale why such a result should be true. So this gives us a reformulation of the minimum of f, but if we want to be able to compute it, we, we now only have to put a degree bound on the sum of squares, and this is what we do next. So we take some degree bound, let's call it 2r, and we restrict the minimization to all sums of squares h, which have degree at most 2r. And in this way, we get a parameter, let's call it uh, f uh, sub r. And by definition, by construction, these bounds become better and better as the degree uh, increases. And if you let the degree tend to infinity by the previous result of Lasser, then we see immediately that the bounds are converging asymptotically to the minimum of f. Of course, 
every bound can be computed via semi-definite programming because it's defined in terms of uh, uh, the variable should be a sum of squares and sums of squares can be uh, modeled using semi-definite programming. But uh, in fact, as Lasser already observed, uh, it can even be computed uh, much easier via an eigenvalue computation. And uh, we are going to return to that in, in a few slides. But so see, so the bound can be computed uh, efficiently if we fixed the degree R. There is a but which we sh one should be uh, uh, aware of, and the but is that in order to be able to at all compute the bound, what we need to know are the moments of the reference measure mu. So the moments are the, this m alpha, which are the moments of the monomials x to the alpha with respect to, to the mu. Because if you want to express, for instance, the integral of f the mu, then you see that you write f as a uh, com linear combination of the monomials, and you see that you get this expression. You get the combination of the monomials and alpha. So we need to know these moments in order at all to be able to set up the semi-definite program or the eigenvalue computation. So this is a restriction. We cannot do this uh, on, uh, we cannot carry out this computation on uh, all set scale because computing moments, even volumes, is a hard problem in general. But as observed in the very beginning, it's already interesting to restrict our attention to very special sets like the cube, the ball, the simplex, or the sphere. And if we select well the, uh, the measure, the reference measure mu, then these moments are known in, uh, in, in even in uh, analytic form. So, 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 to, so one should keep this in mind that in order to be able at all to, to express the bounds, and we need to know the moments, or we need to, to have a way to have access to the moments. Okay, so we have uh, uh, defined this bound, and maybe one small uh, uh, observation, which is maybe handy to, to, to notice, is a link, there was a very natural link to cubature rules, because this bound, this bound is defined in terms of integration of polynomial. So this is a fact which was uh, observed by uh, Martinez and Corsos, which says the following. So suppose we have a cubature rule on the set K with positive weights. So we have a set of points Xi, uh, we have weights Wi positive, and this cu cubature rule is exact. Let's assume it's exact for integrating polynomials of degree D plus 2R. And the claim is as follows. It's an easy claim. It says that if if our polynomial f, which we want to minimize at degree d, then the following holds. So let's just look again at the bound fr. By definition, it's the integral of fh. But fh, by construction, have degree, has degree at most d plus 2r. So we can use the cubic rule to express the integral. So it's equal to the sum of wi fh evaluated at the points xi. Now we can pull out f of xi replace it by its lower bound, which is a minimum of f at all the cubic points, and then remains a summation of wh uh, x evaluated at xi, which is exactly the integral of h the mu, which is equal to 1, because by assumption we have a probability measure. So this term is equal to 1, it disappears, and what do we get? We get that the bound fr is at least the value of f, so at the best cubic point, which is uh, in turn, at least uh, the minimum um, of f. So what does it tell us? So this tells us that if we happen to know a cubature uh, uh, rule, and, uh, and and we know the behavior of f on the on the on the cubature point, then the range between the best cubature point and the minimum of f serves as a lower bound for the range between the bound fr and the minimum of f. So this gives us a tool to give lower bounds on the rate of convergence of the hierarchy uh, of bounds fr. So for instance, we have used this together with Etienne to, to, to show that in the case of the unit sphere, when f is linear, then the range, error range of the bounds uh, fr is at least one over r squared cannot get better than this. And as we are going to, to see later, actually, it's also at most 1 over r squared. 
So which means that uh, we have the exact uh, behavior of the error range for the upper bounds FR. It's, it, it's in the order of one over R squared. So maybe you, you may say, well, actually, why bother about the bounds FR? Because we have anyway these curvature points, which give us an even better bound. Well, the point is that um, to have a good curvature rule, you need most often to have uh, uh, exponentially many points. So computing this minimum would be a difficult problem because even if you know the curvature points, then you have exponentially many of them, which is the case, for instance, if you think of the hypercube, then you would have exponentially many uh, curvature points here. Exponentially many in terms of the dimension. So which is one reason to prefer to yet look at this uh, uh, measure-based upper bounds of R uh, rather than the best curvature points. And, and in general, it's a very difficult problem to find exact uh, curvature rules anyways. Okay, so maybe let us uh, show just a small uh, example to get the feeling how this uh, sums of squares density behaves. So here I look at the Motskin polynomial, which is shown here, which we optimize, which we minimize over the box. And uh, as is uh, well known, there are four minimizers, one, two, three, four, shown at this uh, values here. So here, this shows the optimal <coughs> sorry, sum of square densities of degree 12. Sorry. Here we see the optimal sum of square density of degree 16. So we see that we start having peaks growing at uh, uh, above the four minimizers. At degree 20, the peaks are growing even further. Degree 24, they grow, so they become higher and thinner. So this is illustrating the behavior that uh, uh, the optimal sum of squares is trying to mimic uh, how the Dirac delta would, would look at the global minimizer. And in this case, it, it's even picking the four global minimizers immediately, but it depends uh, numerically what happens. Okay, so as announced, the goal is to understand what is the rate of convergence of uh, uh, the measure-based upper bound. So the rate of convergence, here I denote it as ER of F, which is a, the difference between the bound and the true minimum. Actually, this depends not only on F and on R, it also depends on the set K, of course, and on the reference measure, which is uh, put on the set K. It's important to keep this in mind. So in this table, I want to show you what are the results which are known, and after, and after that, we will see how to, to, to reach these results. So the first case to consider is a very simple case when K is just an interval. So, compute, I mean, fr from a computational point of view, it may not seem so interesting, but actually for the analysis point of view, as we are going to see later, understanding the behavior of the bounds for the interval is actually crucial to get uh, the behavior for more complicated sets and, uh, and uh, measures. So, the first set of results is for the interval, minus one, one. Uh, we have a first result when f is linear, then we get uh, the ratio one over r squared. And when equipping the interval with any uh, Jacobi type measure, so that's a measure with a weight one minus x squared to some lambda, where lambda is at least minus one. <clears throat> if we, and, and then the next result will be allowing any polynomial f, but then restricting the measure to be a Chebyshev type. So lambda is minus a half. So these first two results were obtained together with Etienne. And uh, later, together with uh, Lucas, we saw how to extend the result with, for uh, any polynomial and any uh, Chebyshev uh, and any uh, Jacobi measure when lambda is at least minus a half. And after that, knowing these results, then we can uh, uh, describe what are the results which we know for other sets like the sphere or the ball or the simplex or so-called round convex body. In all these cases, equipped with suitable measures, we are also able to show the rate in one over R squared. So this is the first class of results. So a, a number of sets equipped with a number of measures for which we are able to show the rate in a quadratic rate in one over R squared. Then comes the second class of uh, results where we can do um, 
uh, has a general class of sets K, namely convex bodies or so-called FET semi-algebraic sets, where we can show something which is not exactly one over R square, but we have this log factor. And this, this is in blue because this is going to, 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 to rely on a different kind of uh, technique. This is recent result with Lucas. So now the, the, the rest of, in the rest of the tutorial, I want to try to explain you first uh, roughly how to get the blue rate. And then the rest will be devoted on how to get the red rates in uh, one over R square. So we have two different rates that we are able to show and and these two rates will differ, will uh, be reached using two different proof strategies. So let me discuss the first proof strategy. And this first strategy will just go back to the definition in a sense and to the basic insight, which was that what we need to do is to design nice sums of squares polynomial densities, which look like the Dirac delta at a global minimizer. And, and then you can try to, to to design these uh, sums of square densities. And this is what we have been doing for some time. So we had an early paper together with Etienne and our uh, PhD students, our sum, where we could show a rate in one over square root of R. And for this result, we, we used, for, for the sum of square density, we used, we used truncations of the Taylor expansion of the normal distribution around a global minimizer. Then we had a follow-up work where we could uh, get an improvement, so one over R, and then using for H truncations of the Taylor expansion of the exponential function, evaluated at uh, uh, the, the, the polynomial F, and suitably selecting this parameter, this temperature parameter, uh, as one over R. And so an uh, interesting uh, uh, link with uh, simulated uh, annealing. So if in, already in this second result here, so we see that our H was rather special actually, because it was obtained by taking a special univariate sum of square, evaluated at minus F over T. And in order to get the uh, 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 best uh, uh, rate in, with this logarithm R square divided by R square, Actually, we, 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 we again use this basic idea that we restrict ourselves to sums of squares, which are of the form, take a univariate SOSS, which you evaluate at F. But, and then the whole uh, uh, trick consists of suitably defining uh, uh, this uh, univariate S, sum of square, and for this, we use so-called half needle polynomials, which are uh, widely used in approximation theory and which are defined in terms of uh, Chebyshev polynomials. So I, I don't want to go into the details. This is uh, a, a bit technical, so I will not give any more details about that. But about this, let me just mention maybe that uh, uh, the, so in this way, we are actually analyzing a weaker uh, hierarchy of bounds, weaker because we restrict ourselves to H's a univariate sum of square evaluated at F. So already this weaker hierarchy has this behavior, so the stronger hierarchy has also this behavior. And the motivation for this uh, uh, weaker hierarchy comes from a paper by uh, Lasser, where he showed that, uh, uh, which is based on, on somehow using, uh, taking the push forward measure by the polynomial F. But uh, let, let me leave it at, at that. So this first strategy, which is go back to the definition and try to design a nice polymer sum of square densities, uh, uh, we have been able to follow this strategy and we get this uh, rate as shown here. So the natural question is how can, can we get rid of this factor? Probably this factor is just a, 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 a side item from the analysis and it's actually not needed. But, uh, so we can read, get rid of this factor in some special case. And for this, we have to follow a completely different strategy. And this is what I want to discuss next in the rest of the talk. So this different strategy will be, uh, we are going to reformulate the parameter, so the measure base bound, 
as an eigenvalue problem and then relate it to roots of orthogonal polynomials. And uh, who's following this route, we are going to see that you are able to get rid of the log uh, factor for many cases. Okay, so from now on, we are going to uh, uh, deal with first reformulating the bound as an eigenvalue problem and then relate the bound to roots of orthogonal polynomials and then uh, we will uh, uh, see how to get the analysis from that. So may maybe before I go on, maybe it's a nice point to stop in case somebody has a question. So, Hello, Monique. Yes. Good Hello, morning. Peter. Good morning. Um, so, in this uh, bound that you give, um, do you have an estimation of the the O, the constant? <laughs> this is a good question, Bernard. So, there, there is a lot of stuff which is uh, uh, hidden in the big O. Maybe you will get. Uh, uh, so, you mean in the in this first set here? Yeah, it it, it contains a lot of. Uh, of stuff about the polynomial. For instance, the Lipschitz constant of the polynomial plays a role, um, um, among many other things. So, mm -hmm. in, in, for the second analysis, maybe you will uh, uh, you will see a bit what comes into the picture. For instance, uh, one of the items which will play a role will be uh, an upper bound on the Frobenius norm of the Hessian of the polynomial. So there is a lot of stuff which com comes into the big hole, which is hidden in the big hole. Okay. Thank you. Good. So first, let's start with, give it, with uh, uh, giving the eigenvalue reformulation for the bounds. So I have just repeated here the definition of the bound. Uh, we search for sum of square or h of degree at most to r, uh, whose integral is 1. And we want to minimize the integral of f h. And so mu is a fixed reference measure supported by the set gain. So, so with this uh, first uh, result, it shows already in the original paper by Lasser, which reformulates the bound as a uh, smallest generalized eigenvalue. So for this, we have to introduce two matrices. So the first matrix is A of F, so with an index R. So it's a matrix which is indexed by all monomials of degree at most R. And the alpha beta entry is the integral of F, X alpha, X beta. That's the first matrix. And the second matrix is the same, but now we just, the alpha beta entry is just the integral of X alpha, X beta. Then the result is that FR is the smallest generalized eigenvalue of the pair A of F b. In other words, this is the largest lambda for which the matrix a r of f minus lambda b r is positive semi-definite. And this is not a, a difficult thing to do. This is, will be the uh, goal of the first exercise, which we will discuss and distribute later, later today. So it's nice. It's very nice because you have it as a, a generalized eigenvalue. It's even nice, so maybe to have uh, to get rid of this word generalized and to have it as a smallest eigenvalue of a single matrix, and this is also uh, possible to do. For this, it it's suffices to work in a different basis. So here we have defined the matrices A and B using the monomial basis. So what we can do instead is look at an orthonormal basis which is uh, constituted by the orthogonal polynomials P alpha with respect to the inner product, which is associated with the measure mu. So we have our reference measure mu. We define this inner product, where the, the inner product of two uh, polynomials P and Q is given by the integral of the product PQ on the set K with respect to the measure mu. So this defines an inner product. And with respect to this inner product, we are now taking uh, an orthonormal basis, which we denote by P alpha. So once we have this orthonormal basis, P alpha, we can define the corresponding matrix. Let's call it MR of F. So it's again indexed by all alpha beta of size at most R. But now the 
alpha beta entry is going to be the integral of f p alpha p beta. So you see, before we had f x alpha x beta, but now we take f p alpha p beta. So if we look at the analog of what the B matrix would be, it would be p alpha p beta. So the integral of p alpha p beta is going to be zero if alpha are different from beta, and it's going to be equal to one if alpha equal to beta. So the analog of B is now the identity matrix. So from this, we see that in fact, the, the parameter fr can be reformulated as the smallest eigenvalue of the matrix mr of f. So, so it, it, it's nice we have now just the smallest eigenvalue of a single matrix. So we may think of this matrix mr of f as a moment matrix. So where we take the alpha beta entry is the moment of f times p alpha p beta. Okay. So this is giving us uh, uh, the bound is reformulated as the smallest eigenvalue of a single matrix. So this already gives uh, 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 some hope that, that we, we might be able to use this information in order to uh, uh, give information about how the bound behaves. So not only uh, we can reformulate uh, the bound in terms of the sum smallest eigenvalue of this matrix, but we can also find once we have the smallest eigenvalue we can also find the optimal sum of squares density so this is what the second result says so suppose we have an eigenvector u for the smallest eigenvalue then we define the corresponding polynomial u of x which is the combination of the orthonormal polynomials p alpha well so the sum of u alpha p alpha and then the claim is that if you take the square of u this gives you an optimum sum of square density for the parameter uh, fr. So you just have to check these two conditions. It's the, sum, the integral of u square is one and the integral of u square f is equal to the bound. And this is again an easy exercise. Okay, so we have uh, done the first step, which is reformulating the bound in terms of the smallest eigenvalue of a certain uh, matrix, this matrix uh, mr of f. So the analysis, I repeat myself, the analysis now relies on the smallest eigenvalue of this matrix. And let's recall that this matrix depends on the set K and on the measure mu. Mu here, you have K here. So in general, it's not going to be uh, uh, so easy to understand the, the behavior of the smallest eigenvalue, but there are some situations where we know very well the behavior. And this is what we will exp exploit. So the crucial fact indeed is that the behavior of this smallest eigenvalue is well understood in a very special case, in the univariate case, when f is linear, so f of x is x, and k is just the inter an interval, for instance, minus one, one, equipped with a nice measure of a Jacobi type. So Jacobi type measure is uh, a measure uh, which has a weight function with respect to the Lebesgue measure, where the weight function takes this form, one minus x to some lambda, one plus x to some lambda prime, where both lambda lambda prime are bigger than minus one. So this is why these uh, uh, measures are going to uh, come up in, uh, in the rest of the lecture. So for such a measure, the corresponding orthogonal polynomials are known as the Jacobi polynomials, and they are also very well understood, and their roots are very well understood. So here I just recall one of a classical result, which says that the smallest root of a Jacobi polynomial of the grid K, the behavior is exactly minus one plus uh, one, a term which behaves exactly like one over K square. So here is uh, the term in one over K square, which reminds us of the, the, the one over r square, which we want. And the one over r square will correspond exactly to this term. But we still have to see how to, to link this, uh, this fact. It's uh, what I will do, do next. But first, here are some examples of uh, Jacobi uh, uh, measures which are of interest. So when, so mostly we will just say that lambda is lambda prime. Then the Jacobi polynomials are also known as the Gegenbauer polynomials. Uh, in the special case when we, we choose minus a half for lambda and lambda primes, then we get the so-called Chebyshev polynomial, and the measure we call it the Chebyshev measure. 
And of course, if you take them both equal to zero, then you just get to the back measure and the corresponding polynomial, so the genre polynomials. So this polynomial uh, uh, will also play a role in the next uh, tutorial by uh, So as, as uh, I, I uh, uh, indicated here, the crucial fact is that the behavior is of the smallest eigenvalue is well understood in the uh, special univariate case when f is linear and uh, k is uh, the interval minus one one. So this is uh, what I repeat here. Our strategy will be in a first uh, case uh, to, to finish the analysis of the bound for the univariate case when k is the interval. We will first deal when f is linear, just f of x is x, and mu is any Jacobi measure. And second, we will deal with the case when f is quadratic, and f and mu is actually a very special measure, just a Chebyshev measure. These are the two cases where we are going to be able to finish the analysis in a first step. And then, once we have this, we can deduce all the other cases which I announced in the big table in the very beginning from these special cases by applying a number of tricks. Uh, so trick number one will be that it suffices to analyze quadratic polynomials. Trick number two will be sometimes to use an integration trick. For instance, for the case of the sphere, we are going to see that we can reduce to the univariate case uh, by uh, doing some integration trick. And the third trick which we are going to use is that if we know results for a given pair, then we can transport them to another pair using some so-called local similarity conditions, which roughly say that if the set K and K hat look sufficiently similar around the minimizer, and if the measure mu and mu hat are well behaved that nicely, then we can carry transport results from a one known pair to a non-known pair. Okay, so this gives a bit the, uh, the, the, the sketch of what's going to come next. So in the first step, I want to uh, specialize to the, to, let us look at the case of the uh, univariate, as a univariate case. So if, if there are, and maybe I stop a few, a few seconds, if there are some questions, I can take them now. So it seems no question. So, oh yeah. So may, maybe first let's uh, uh, get, get rid of the first trick because then it's nice if we, if we already, uh, let's explain the first trick, then we, it will tell us that we can uh, focus our attention to quadratic polynomials. And it's a simple trick. So it's nice to have it out of the way uh, first. So why ca can we reduce the analysis to quadratic polynomials? And it's very simple. It's simply, uh, by we, we just use Taylor theorem. So by Taylor theorem, if we have a polynomial f, and if a is a global minimizer of f in k, then we can upper bound f, but by this uh, um, so this uh, first quadratic uh, upper estimator, let's call it g, which is obtained by Taylor uh, uh, expansion. So here, this gamma is just an upper bound on the maximum of the norm of the Hessian at all points in K. So this upper estimator G is a quadratic polynomial, first property. And second property, if you evaluate it at A, it's equal to F of A. So which means that F and G take the same minimum value on the set K. So because of these two properties, then we have that the bound of order R for F is upper bounded by the bound of order R for G. And because they take the same minimum on K, we all know that the error range for F is also upper bounded by the error range for G. So as a consequence, it suffices to analyze the error bound for a quadratic polynomial. So, and this is what we are now going to do next. We are only going to focus our attention to linear or quadratic polynomials. Okay. So now I go to the first most simple setting. So the univariate case, and we are going to, to deal in turn with two cases when F is linear and then 
when f is quadratic. So a, a crucial result, which is going to, to, to be of use to us, is a, a very classical result about the orthogonal polynomials. So we have the interval, k is minus 1, 1, equipped with a measure mu. And let pk be an orthonormal basis with respect to the scalar product associated to this measure mu. And it's graded. By this, I mean that the degree of pk is k. And when you look at p0, p1 up to pn, you get the basis of the space of polynomial of up to degree n. Then there is a well-known uh, three-term recurrence for uh, these orthogonal polynomials, which says that xpk depends linearly on pk minus 1, pk, and pk plus 1. So there exists this scalars a, k, b, k, so that a xpk can be expressed in this way. So this is the first, it's a three-term recurrence. It's actually not difficult at all to show. It's also a, a goal of one of the exercises. And there is a second property which uh, will be uh, useful to us, which is uh, well-known properties of orthogonal polynomials, that it has pk has k distinct real roots in the interval minus 1, 1. It's also not so difficult to show. And then we can look at uh, uh, this matrix MR of X. So by definition, this is a matrix was, so now we are in the, in the univariate case. So this matrix is indexed by uh, I and J running from zero up to R. And the IJ entry is given by the integral of X PI PJ. So using the three term uh, uh, recurrence relationship here, one can check that this matrix uh, MR of X is actually uh, has a very nice shape. It is tri-diagonal. So on the main diagonal, you have the BK coming in, and on the first and up and lower diagonal are the AI. This you can check using the three-term recurrence uh, relationship. So remember that we were interested in uh, the smallest eigenvalue of this uh, matrix MR of X. And the next thing to do will be to relate this smallest eigenvalue to the roots of the orthogonal polynomials. So this is what the next theorem is saying. The eigenvalues of the matrix M R of X are actually the roots of the degree R plus 1 orthogonal polynomial, P R plus 1. So now that we have all these elements in hand, we can actually complete the analysis. We have all the elements in, uh, in hand. So our polynomial is f of x is x, which we want to minimize on the minus 1, 1 interval. So the minimum of f is, of course, minus 1. And we want to understand the, uh, how the difference between the bound of order r, f, r minus f min behaves. So the first uh, thing to remember is that we have shown that f, r is the smallest eigenvalue of the matrix m, r of x. By the above theorem, we can conclude that it is also equal to the smallest root of the orthogonal polynomial PR plus 1. And as observed a few slides uh, above, the, or the smallest root of the orthogonal polynomial is well understood for uh, uh, ge general Jacobi measures. We know that it's in the, it behaves like minus 1 plus a term in the order 1 over r squared. And now we are done. We can conclude because this minus 1 is exactly the minimum of f. So this permits us to conclude the analysis. So the error range is exactly in the order 1 over r squared. So what, has, uh, 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 what was crucial here was, ex was really the fact that we knew the behavior of the smallest root of the orthogonal polynomial. Okay, let's now try to deal with the case when f is quadratic of the form x squared plus kx. So there are two cases. If the, polynomial, if the minimizer is on the boundary, 
then it's uh, easy to see that actually f is a, an upper estimator which is linear and has the same minimum. So if we have an upper estimator which is linear, we already know how to uh, evaluate the error for the for linear uh, polynomial. We just saw it. So then we can immediately conclude that the error uh, for f is also in 1 over r squared. And here, actually, this is also uh, uh, valid for any Jacobi measure on the interval, minus 1. OK. Second case would be when the minimizer is in the interior. So let's go back. Then we know that the bound is the smallest eigenvalue of the matrix MR of F. So how does the matrix MR of F look like? It, uh, yeah, the entry ij is the integral of f times pi pj, and f is now this quadratic uh, polynomial. And now, using the three term uh, recurrence, we can uh, see that it's going to be uh, uh, five diagonal metrics because we have quadratic, so that's why now we get five diagonals. So, this, this fact that it's a uh, uh, five diagonal metrics is true. Uh, for any uh, measure we would put. But if we want to be able to say something about the smallest eigenvalue of this matrix, we need to, uh, at least we, we were, were only able to do it in, when selecting a very special measure mu on the interval minus one, one, and namely the Chebyshev measure. Because if we pick the Chebyshev measures and the, the coefficient in the three term uh, relationships are very simple, they are just, uh, they do not depend on the degree. And this is why for the matrix MR of F, we get a very, uh, we get a matrix which is almost triplets. So except if we, if you discard the first two rows and the first two columns, which are a bit uh, messy, then you see that the rest is, uh, it's triplets. So we'll, we'll, same entry on the diagonal and then a B on the first diagonal and then a C on the second diagonal where the values are given here. And this is the fact, uh, the fact that it is almost triplets is the key to, to which enables us to analyze how the, the smallest eigenvalue behaves. So let me, let me show you how to do this. So our matrix looks like this. We have a, 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 this B matrix which is uh, everything where you have deleted the first two rows and columns, which is, so this B matrix is nice. It's five diagonal and triplets. So what to do in order to analyze the smallest eigenvalue, what we do is let's get rid of the uh, two uh, first two rows and columns, which are nasty. We don't like them, so we get rid of them and we replace them by what you should put in order to get a symmetric circulant matrix. And let's call it C, this circular matrix where you have uh, uh, delete the first two rows and columns and you embed B in a circular matrix. And then using interlacing of eigenvalues, you get that the smallest eigenvalue of MR of F is at most the smallest eigenvalue of B, which in turn is at most the, small, the third smallest eigenvalue of C. But now we are at home because C is symmetric circulant, so we can compute the eigenvalues and we can estimate them and we can see that the third smallest eigenvalue behaves like this term, which is nothing but the minimum of F. So this is a minimum of F plus a term in, o, in a big O of one over R square. So, so we obtain the desired analysis. So what, for the interval, I could use a Chebyshev measure when f is quadratic in consequence for any f, we get that the error bound uh, can also be estimated as, as 1 over r squared. And here I have put the theorem not only for the interval, but also for the hypercube, because if you have it for an interval, you do a, a product argument and you get it also for the hypercube. So this is uh, 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 this argument is concluding the, the, the very first part, which was uh, how to deal with the basic case of the univariate case. And uh, now to, 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 to finish up, we have to see how to, how to, from this, how to, to transport these results from the interval of, to more general uh, set scale. But uh, maybe I can stop again for a few seconds if somebody has a question.
Okay, so as, as uh, promised now, I want to show you how to extend these basic results, how to transport them to get information on other sets. So first, uh, let's see how we can uh, uh, derive the analysis for the sphere. So remember that we have already argued that it was enough to, to, to deal with a quadratic uh, uh, polynomial because by Taylor, we could upper estimate F by this quadratic uh, uh, with Taylor approximation. But since X and A are now in the sphere, actually we can replace this by a linear term. So what we have is that F has actually a linear upper estimator. Up to rotation and translation, we may actually assume that our linear polynomial f, so we may, is actually has a very special form. It's of the form, let's say, it's a, just a coordinate polynomial x1. So our next goal is to understand how the bound behave when f of x is just the coordinate polynomial x1. And uh, as I want to explain, we are going to reduce to the analysis for the interval minus one one equipped with a suitable Jacobi measure. So we look at the interval minus one one, which we equip with this Jacobi measure here, with this uh, lambda is n minus three over two. And so we consider the, the very special univariate case of minimizing x one over the interval minus one one. Uh, and let h of x1 be a, a univariate optimal sum of square density for the corresponding bound for this problem uh, when the interval is equipped with this special measure mu. And now we use this univariate h of x1 to get a nice sum of square density for the multivariate problem asking to minimize x1 over the unit sphere, sphere where we equip the unit sphere with the half measure. And this is done simply by using this integration trick, which says that if we integrate h of x1 on the interval with respect to this weight measure, we get a constant times the integral of h of x1 with respect to the half measure. And the same applies when integrating x1 times h of x1. So now we can conclude because by assumption, h of x1 had integral equal to one. And we knew that this term is minus one plus a term in one over r square. So this is telling us that if h of x1 was an optimal sum of square density for the univariate problem, then c H1, H of X1 gives us uh, a, a good sum of square density uh, for the multivariate problem on the unit sphere with the same rate of convergence. So this is a trick which enables us to conclude that for the case of uh, the unit sphere, we have this behavior of the bounds in one over R square. So in the last uh, couple of minutes, I just want to finish with uh, uh, giving you a, a glimpse on how to extend to other sets uh, by using a so-called local similarity trick. So this is this idea that suppose we, we know how the bounds behave for a, a given set k hat equipped with a measure which has a weight double the hat. And, and now we would like to, to understand how the bounds behave for a new pair, it's, it's in red, k equipped with a, a weight measure w. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm now going to show you a number of conditions which if they are satisfied, then we are able indeed to transport the result. So suppose a is a minimizer of f on k. Uh, we have the following settings that the, the, the red set is contained in the blue set. And they are locally similar at the minimizer L, which means that there is a small ball, so the minimizer is a red point, there is a small ball around the minimizer, which 
so that if you intersect it with a small set or the big set, you get the same, uh, they have the same intersection. So this, so this is true here. The two sets behave the same around these uh, red points. And here also, the, the, the two sets uh, look locally similar around this red point. Of course, if I would have taken the red point in the interior of K, then it would be clearly true that the two sets are also locally similar around uh, any interior point. So this is what it means that the two sets should be locally similar at, uh, at the global minimizer A. And now here are some conditions about the two weight functions. So they should be also locally similar around A. So the first condition is that they are related if we look at a small neighborhood around the minimizer A. And the other condition is that uh, the, the red, so W should be upper bounded by W hat on the interior of the set K. And if these conditions are satisfied, then what one can show is that F is an upper estimate G on K hat, which is exact at A, which means that F of A is equal to G of M. And satisfying the following relation, so the error for the bound for the pair of KW is upper bounded by the error for the pair of K hat, W hat, and the upper estimate of G. So by assumption, we know this, uh, uh, if we know the behavior for this upper bound, then we will be able to understand immediately how the error bound behaves for the, for the red pair, KW. And, and this is uh, the recipe which uh, enables us to, 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 carry, to carry the analysis over for all the other sets which were announced. So first, we can extend from the Chebyshev case to any lambda at least minus a half on the interval. Second, uh, we can deal with any set K equipped with the Lebesgue measure in the case when the minimizer lies in the interior. For instance, for the set uh, when the case for the case of the simplex equipped with the Lebesgue measure. Uh, so now, from now on, it's enough to worry uh, in the situations when the minimizer lies on the boundary because we have already seen in the second point what happens if the minimizer lies in the interior. So when the minimizer lies on the boundary, so what we do is, okay, it's on the boundary, here is a simplex. What we do is we transport, so we apply a, a fine mapping on the simplex to make it look like this one. And we choose it in such a way that the minimizer is going to be on the border, on that border or that border, not on the interior. We want to have the minimizer here or here. And then you place this simplex inside a hypercube. And uh, uh, now we can use this local similarity trick because we know how the bounds behave for the, for the big cube. So using this similarity trick, we can also know how the bounds behave for the simplex. Uh, for the ball, uh, you do again a kind of similarity, similarity argument as what we did for the, for the sphere by using an integration, integration trick again. And uh, uh, finally, the most general class of uh, convex uh, of, of, of sets which we can analyze using this kind of techniques would be this class of so-called round convex bodies, which means that uh, at every point on the boundary, we have an inscribed ball and a circumscribed ball which are tangent. And, and, and then for, so for this class, we have again uh, this uh, analysis in one over R squared. Okay, so I finished. This is my last slide. Uh, so I have uh, explained, I, I hope I've been able to carry out what, uh, to, to explain what are the main ideas. So the main ideas were to, to relate uh, uh, the analysis of the bound to the analysis of uh, the, the roots of suitable orthogonal polynomials. And this was very much uh, uh, relying on the fact that we were uh, suitably uh, choosing the measure we put on the set K. If you put an arbitrary measure, then you don't know what the orthogonal polynomials are, and then there is no hope of being able to understand how the roots behave. 
So this analysis works for polynomials, but it also works for rational functions. And uh, this analysis can also be uh, uh, applied to understand uh, uh, the behavior of the corresponding upper bound for the general problem of moments, which was uh, discussed in uh, detail uh, yesterday in, the, in this lecture by, uh, by Etienne. So I stop here, and uh, here are a few papers on which the, the, the lecture is based. So I, I, I stop here. Thanks a lot for your, for your attention. Thank you. Thanks for the yeah, very nice uh, tutorial. Um, perfectly also on time. Um, yeah, are there any questions for Monique? Uh, before that, I think Monique, I think there's something in front of in front of your camera. So you, we only see you to 80%, I think. Oh, you should have told us. Oh, okay. Yeah. But this I think only happened in the last couple of minutes. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah, any questions for Monique? Hello. I would like to ask a question. May I? Okay. Uh, thank you for the very um, instructive talk, Monique, um, about your second last slide. Um, could you go there, please? The condition, um, or is this, so no, I'm talking about the slide where you said that when the minimizers in the interior, ah, sorry, so it wasn't the second last slide. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, so, ah, yes, this is point two. Um, so, th does this also generalize to sets K, which are the closure of, of an open set by um, perturbing F so that you can force the interior as you so, the, so that you can force the minimizer to be in, t in the interior, even if it's on the boundary, like uh, adding some small penalty terms to, to enforce the, the minimizer to lie in the interior. I, I guess then you are going to, to, to get, you don't exactly analyze then what you wanted to analyze, no? If you are told. So, so I'm, I'm wondering about a set K, which is the closure of its interior. And yeah. for the unlucky case oh. where the minimizer is on the boundary. Actually, so okay. So when the set K is a, is a closure of its interior, and if the set K is semi-algebraic, mm -hmm. actually our first uh, uh, technique applies. So there you could show that uh, we at least know that we can show that uh, the bound behaves. I mean the the rate in log R over R square. Okay, but but here you have um, one over r squared, right? Yeah, yeah. So so that's. But uh, I'm 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 a bit wary now to tell you yes or no. I would have to think about whether this okay. one of r square uh, extends okay. to this case. Uh, I would have to think about. Okay, but but, but, at uh, least, but at least what we can show is log r over r square. It's an interesting question also, but I, I, I would have to think about whether this is uh, okay. Thanks. Thank you, Monique, and thanks again for, for the very nice talk. Thank you. So, more questions? Hi, Monique. Um, uh, you know that I like uh, symmetric problems. So um, I was wondering, um, does this analysis somehow um, extend to problems that have symmetries, especially in cases where maybe the, the unreduced problems are um, maybe even infinite sized or um, go towards infinity? For example, uh, the polynomials that are fully symmetric, we can permute the variables in any way. Um, after symmetry reduction, it's a finite hierarchy, but before it's infinite. Can we still do some analysis here? With similar techniques, maybe. Oh, it's a nice question, Daniel. I think it's all uh, wide open. So you mean, uh, 
whether you could analyze the original infinite dimensional hierarchy, yeah, or problem. I mean, yeah. I mean, if, if you symmetrize problem falls into one of the settings, which is described here, then you have it for free, but uh, I guess it's not what you're asking. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a different setting since um, the, the symmetry to hierarchy is still equivalent to the original one. So you're still somehow solving um, SOS in, in uh, infinite variables. So we, we didn't look at all at this. Okay, it's a, yeah. Nice to look. Okay. Okay. But thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, I, 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 Lucas, are, are you online? Yes. So, we should maybe, we have a list of exercises. So, maybe we can, uh, oh, you, okay. Hopefully, if you click on this link, you should be able to download the exercises. Uh, at least for me, it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so for all we have prepared, Lucas and I have prepared a list of exercises. So some of them I have given them through the throughout the lecture, but we thought it's maybe nice to type them in in a separate PDF. So if you click now on the link that uh, Lucas is uh, sharing, you can get the the PDF of the exercises. Uh, we can discuss them later this afternoon. Okay, well, according to Felix, it works. So then it should work for everyone. Yeah, it also works for me, but I don't promise to do any exercises. <laughs> um, I, I see by now, also want to say something? So. Um, yes, about the, so about this weight, one over R square. So you, you say this is the optimal uh, rate one can expect, or, uh, or you think this could be in general, in general, Bernard. So for general, uh, for general, uh, uh, probably for general sets and general polynomials, this is probably the rate. Huh? And this log R is uh, just an uh, artifact that you are not able to get rid of. But there are situations where you can get better than one over R. Um, so I, I will not forget, ex uh, remember exactly, but um, uh, there are classes of polynomials uh, where we can get a, a better rate. So maybe Lucas remembers. So uh, so basically, if you have some polynomial, which is very flat around its minimizer, so think of like uh, X to the power 10 or something, then you can get a better rate. But I think indeed in general, this R square is, uh, is best possible. So, so like we had the lower, but we, we had this, uh, I mentioned the fact that for the sphere, for instance, and just a linear polynomial on the sphere, then you cannot do better than one over R square. Uh, using for the linear general polynomial. Yeah. For, for linear already. Already, okay. Yeah, so then it doesn't mean that for a, a general one, you cannot do better. Okay, so, so then I, there are classes of polynomials and sets where you cannot do better than R square the best answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think before we close the session, I take the opportunity to, to also ask a question. Um, so did you think about the case of trigonometric polynomials? So especially in the interval minus one, one, I think then we have probably more symmetries because then things become yeah, periodic. Then my question would be, can you improve in the setting the one divided by R squared? Or do you think it's hopeless at that point? We, we didn't think about it wrong. So I, I don't dare to say anything. We didn't, we didn't look at all at it. So this, is, this would, would be interesting, yes. Yeah, because you, it, would, it would say if one divided by R squared is really the maximum you can get, or if I mean, because I think trigonometric polynomials are much more natural on minus one one than polynomials. So then what I would hope that you maybe improve, but if you don't improve, it auto says uh, that's a limit. So on, on uh, yeah. Or minus mm -hmm. pi pi, if you want. 
Uh, I mean, we have the fact that for on the interval and linear polynomials on the interval, uh, one over R square is also best, huh? because it's exactly the behavior of the smallest root of the orthogonal polynomials. Well, I think that's an indication that this really is the best it can do. Probably, yeah. Okay, good. So then, see anything? Anybody here anymore? Okay, then, thanks again. And now I think it's time for a short break. I will get a coffee. Thank you.